So the next set of speakers that we have, we have two speakers, they're each going to split the time a little bit, and we're going to be talking about KM for impact and innovation. So without further ado, I want to just introduce Owen Wilson, who's the Senior KM Advisor to the United Nations, currently working and supporting the UNICEF Office of Innovation. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Owen. Thank you. Hi. Good morning and congratulations on your bravery to come to a session which mentions multivariate statistics. <laughs> I'm not going to talk too much about them. I was, uh, you know, a lot of UN organizations and other organizations are really looking to innovation to get more out of their limited resources, to deliver more outcomes, more outputs. And as a knowledge management person, I wanted to know how can we help this mission, this vision to use innovation more? How is knowledge management able to contribute? And so I, I did a study to explore the relationship between knowledge management <coughs> practices and innovation in international organizations using structural equation modeling. Now, the, one of the big differences is to use knowledge management practices rather than processes, which you often hear about, storing knowledge, <laughs> sharing knowledge. In fact, uh, this kind of uh, process view is most commonly used in quantitative research as well when we want to define knowledge management. Uh, the other thing is, is looking at it for international organizations, which haven't typically... Um, had a structural equation model of this kind. Now, probably your organization has a <coughs> definition of knowledge management, something along li the lines of the process view. Uh, if you ask um, BARD or ChatGBT to look up all the definitions of knowledge management, it will give you something like this as a summary. Some organizations include cultural and environmental elements, some include learning too, but there's a very strong tendency to the process view. I looked at the strategies, the knowledge management strategies of a number of uh, international organizations to look at specifically what do they do in knowledge management. Not, not so much the definition, not this high level approach, but in practice what are all the different things that we do? And I identified over 100 uh, different knowledge management practices from these organizations. Uh, I also found, well, these are really don't, don't represent the definition very well either because they're much more granular and they're uh, much more action-oriented. Uh, now, I mentioned earlier, this kind of uh, measurement for knowledge management hasn't been used before. It's almost always been the process <coughs> approach to knowledge management rather than very granular practices. There are some studies, some quantitative studies, using individual-specific practices. But this is the first time I've tried, I think anyone has tried to pull together all the practices for the purposes of measuring knowledge management. Uh, I categorized them myself. This, this was before November 22 when I could have used uh, a large language model to help me analyze all of that data. And so I did it manually and came up with these kind of categories, which is really only for convenience because it was going to then be subject to data collection and analysis afterwards. Uh, but with more than 100, it was difficult to comprehend them. So using my experience, I came up with these categories. Um, I tried to pick four or five practices from each category to use in the, the survey. Just to blow up one category a little bit to, to try and explain what I mean. So within each category, there's maybe two or three levels of getting down to the practice level. So within networks, network practices, you have different practices to connect people to places or contexts, such as study visits or job rotation. You have practices to connect people to one another, like people finders or communities of practice or interest. We have a lot of practices to connect people to knowledge artifacts, to, to documents, to <coughs> repositories, to libraries. We even use knowledge brokers sometimes. 
And there's even some practices to connect us to partners, um, such as guidance notes. So each of these seven categories had a, a large number of practices, and I chose in the end uh, only 30 to go into the study. Uh, and I know this is too small to read, but it's in the, it, this uh, presentation is available for you to download so you can look at them. These were the questions I used in the study to define knowledge management. Uh, and I didn't want more than 30 because it's very hard to get people to fill in a survey, even knowledge management people. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So I tried to keep it as short as possible. All the questions had to be scaled on a Likert scale. There were also five factors measuring innovation. So in total, there were 35. And what I hoped is that the data would reveal some kind of way of clustering and grouping um, these practices. Because I'd had a go kind of manually. I wasn't really happy with it. I thought maybe the data will, will, will reveal some kind of um, organization schema for practices, um, but it didn't. The practices are highly correlated to one another, keeping in mind these are all not actual knowledge management practices used in international organizations. <coughs> some were more correlated than others. Maybe you can imagine some kind of groupings between them, like I've done here with the dotted line, but in practice, uh, there needs to be a lot more study into making knowledge management practices um, a, a more proven measure of knowledge management. This is the first attempt. There needs to be some more. So why, why use practices in the first place? As I mentioned, other studies typically use a process view, not all of them, but by far the majority. Uh, I found that the process approach doesn't reflect the reality of how international organizations do knowledge management today. They're also quite general. They're too high level. What, so what if you find out that sharing knowledge is good for innovation? It's not really going to guide you into some specific action, or it doesn't necessarily allow you to prioritize. I like practices partly because they de-objectify knowledge. When you go into very granular theories of different activities, um, knowledge is not always a product. Knowledge can be other things. It can be much more addressing tacit knowledge. A lot of practices exist which are not about a product approach to knowledge. Uh, they also tend to be quite outcome-oriented. Practices happen for a purpose, and there is an identified outcome, while processes are a little too general. Uh, they're granular, which means you know, they're small, and you can, you can hopefully group them. And the fact is they're used in reality. This is what international organizations are really doing. And so findings are going to be more informative and more instructive. So I, it also I reflected on our, how we define knowledge management because this definition has really been around for uh, 25 years. This is what we called knowledge management back in the 90s. That's how, how old it is. It feels kind of dated. It um, doesn't reflect the reality of the practices that we use. And so I came up with my own definition for me which is about organizational learning and improvement. You have to build up some kind of memory. This is an organizational memory. It's about how do organizations learn. There's a lot of studies into how we learn as people individually and how we can use learning to improve, but not as much into how organizations learn. It's a bit more complicated. And also, it's about improvement. In the end, we want to use it to innovate, or become more resilient, or become more efficient and effective. In the end, knowledge management practices have a purpose. And so our knowledge, defini knowledge management definition should also highlight the, the purpose, and some do, to be fair. Maybe consider how your organization defines knowledge management. Is it, does it reflect today? Especially with AI, we're going to see a lot of changes. Maybe it's time to revisit how you introduce
the concept of knowledge management to your colleagues, many who will hear about it for the first time. Is that introduction simple? Is it clear? Is it modern? Is it relevant? So, um, as I mentioned, innovation is also about uh, one of those improvements. And in the study, I had 143 knowledge management practitioners. Some of them were also innovation practitioners from 32 organizations. I used 30 practices, actually came from um, this study in last year, and five innovation indicators. Uh, to be honest, not enough of any, but as I say, it's the first time I've, uh, a study like this has gone on in a quantitative sense. It would be great to have more of all of them, more factors, more um, practices to measure knowledge management. It was very difficult to choose 30, um, and certainly more respondents and more organizations too. So, um, so you want to, in case you want to know which innovation measures, I mentioned there were five questions. Here they are. Um, these are used in many other studies, so I didn't make these questions up. I looked at how are other people measuring innovation using structural equation modeling, and these were the questions I picked to represent five kind of areas. There could be more too. And for those of you who are interested, there's some uh, measurements to show you the reliability of those um, factors. So when you load uh, all of those 30 onto, an, onto a variable called knowledge management and these five onto a variable called innovation, this is the reliability of those loadings. So, drum roll. <laughs> <laughs> You want to know which ones were the ones which influenced innovation the most. And it was possible using structural equation modeling to identify um, some of them. I know this is too small to read. Uh, you can see it a little bit better in the uh, handouts. So the model finally identified a model using SAM which had 10 factors describing knowledge management and four <coughs> describing innovation. And the relationship, when you describe those two variables using those factors, you get a very strong relationship between them. And the um, fit of this model is also given here uh, at the bottom for those of you who follow, who are interested in the statistics. So 20 of the variables were eliminated, and uh, plus one innovation variable. So I'm going to talk about the top four very quickly. The ones with a factor loading greater than 0.7. This is probably the, the easiest one to do. And one in every organization that I've been to, people always say we should do it. We ought to do that. We need to learn more from people when they're leaving, not just an exit interview that asks about the employment experience. Ask them what would they do if they were the executive director. Ask them what's broken and we need to fix it. Ask them what did they learn in their time in the organization. What kind of learnings do we actually get from people who leave? Uh, the organizations which do this say that they are more innovative. Adapt organizational practices. So when you learn something, do you apply it in your processes? If you find out that something doesn't work very well, do you fix it? Or do you say, huh, <laughs> doesn't work very well? So this is a little bit more difficult to do. If anyone has tried to adapt their organizational processes, I think you'll know um, you need to be, be uh, quite, you need to work quite hard on that. Um, measuring competencies is probably not so hard, although I haven't seen a lot of organizations do it. I'm curious here, in your organization, how many of you have identified and measure knowledge management competencies? Could you put your hand up if you do that? I see a couple. It's, it's not many, um, but apparently if you do that, and you identify what are knowledge management competencies and measure how are we going as an organization, do we have these competencies, 
that contributes to innovation in your organization. So if you're keen on becoming more innovative, it's a good practice to invest in. And finally, we have a knowledge architecture. This goes, goes beyond an information architecture and is detailed looking into the, the whole entirety of a knowledge process, which might be connected to delivering key knowledge um, outputs or deliverables. How, what is the entire life cycle of knowledge? How do we get from didn't know to know? Uh, quite a detailed activity to do. Um, also not very common. I, I, well, I'm interested. Anyone do this? Anyone have a, a knowledge architecture? Yeah. Oh, wow. I'm going to talk to you two after. <laughs> um, that's great. So, in summary, three takeaways. Yes, some knowledge management practices will support innovation, at least in the context of international organizations. Practices may be more useful than processes as a way of looking at and measuring knowledge management. I think they are. And perhaps we need to review how we define and introduce knowledge management to our co-workers because a lot of us are still using quite dated definitions. And finally, you know, a lot of this, this, this list of practices was put together before November 2022. And we all know what happened in November 22, uh, which of course is changing the future of knowledge management. So I thought about, well, how is it going to change knowledge management practices? And, and of course they're going to change, and probably they've started changing already. I think we're going to focus much more on capturing raw unedited, unanalyzed bits of knowledge and experience in any format, in any language. It's really you know, the, the, the big data approach applied to knowledge. If you found something out, uh, somehow give it to the, the big database in, a, in a, a thought, a snippet, because we're not going to be synthesizing and analyzing <coughs> all of that ourselves. We're probably going to use large language models to help us produce learning on demand and knowledge on demand, answers to questions on demand, and better, they're going to be customized to, to, to me, to the user. I did this online course, uh, you know, one of the UN trainings, which is designed to be a torturous, I think. You have to click through and listen to somebody talking slowly and then click through slides, and this is supposed to be a learning activity, much quicker to ask a large language model to give me a nice, concise summary of what I need to know, and then it's a, a much faster solution. And I think enterprise knowledge management will become more like that. And of course, that's going to lead to a whole different set of practices in the coming few years. So thank you very much. You've been a wonderful audience. <laughs>
and then um, share some of the, the benefits and some of the challenges. Um, so let's dive right in. All right, so here's the question to pull the room. Uh, what do you think this is? Any guesses? Go ahead and... Uh... Summary. Summary, did someone say? Submarine. Oh, submarine, sorry. Submarine, okay. Submarine. <laughs> we have a really great guest, which is a picture designed by ChatGPT to represent your presentation. Command and Control Center is another option. All right, any more? Your office. <laughs> I, my office, yeah, I wish it was my office. Uh, uh, there you go. So whoever said, uh, so I heard, uh, this is a combat information center aboard a World War II era American aircraft carrier. So uh, submarine was pretty darn close. I heard, I think combat information center, someone may have said. So uh, very, very good. And, and the, the reason I bring this up um, is this really kind of uh, gives us a shorthand for the problem that we're trying to solve. So. Uh, by the way, for those, uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to give you guys just the headline of this story. Um, but you can, uh, there's a book called Learning War by Trent Hone uh, that talks about this, uh, as well as in the Agile literature. So if you, if you like this story, uh, there's, there's way more. Pick up his book and check that out. But basically, uh, if you imagine at the start of the war how overwhelming all the new information was coming at the commanders, uh, they had radar, they had radio communications, they're operating at night. Um, the, the, the naval war in the Pacific was very complicated and they needed to evolve. So these leaders were overwhelmed with information and uh, sound familiar? And so um, the, the story tells the story of, of how uh, this idea of a combat information center evolved uh, actually in an agile fashion um, and uh, uh, became the standard by which information is summarized and synthesized for the, the commanders on those ships. So providing situational awareness, enabling decision making in real time. So very much the same problem uh, that, that we're facing that we uh, are working on with sensing and I think probably sounds familiar uh, to, to many of you in the room. So predictive real time sensing, this is our, our uh, leading edge digital transformation initiative focused on executive decision making. So. Um, one of the, the big flagship efforts within our, our company in the digital space. Uh, I've mentioned it for, that it's for executives. Our focus uh, here is on our C-suite and our top executives. So, you know, I, I, I come from a knowledge management background. I led KM for a function at the company. I've got IT experience prior to that. And so I'm used to working with large systems that support high numbers of people. In this case, you know, you're, you're, it's 30, 40 uh, people, the, the, the top executives in the company, so a very different audience. Um, we have domain information from across the business, uh, finance, uh, uh, people or HR type information. Obviously, our pipeline is very important in a biopharma company, uh, supply and brand, commercial products, uh, as well as the external information, competitive intelligence domains and so forth. So a lot of information. Um, that's delivered through a set of KPIs and visualizations, as well as human insight and, and intelligence, all crafted in a compelling uh, user experience. Uh, this was one of the, the first, I think, big examples of doing digital product management, which I'm gonna talk about uh, here in a bit uh, within the company. And so we've kind of setting the way for, for how to approach this. And I, I think there's a very strong knowledge management mentality uh, that, that's built into to this approach. Um, we, we follow Scaled Agile. I'm not going to go into that in this talk. We don't have time, but, you know, I'm sure most of you know what that is. Uh, and then um, we've got uh, a, a really strong release cadence and, and feedback cycle. This is a, what I call multi-product, multi-modality. So we, we have uh, a, a solution that has more than one product. So uh, we have the, we provide us a system, what I call a pull system. So this is a website. Uh, think of a place that an executive can go and, and view this information and, and pull what they need uh, from it, as well as a push modality where we're looking at, uh, you know, triggers and thresholds and, and other things to then push to them 
uh, things they should be aware of. And uh, the third leg of the stool, you guessed it, is that chat natural language experience. Uh, and so that chat modality is obviously a very important thing and we're actively working right now on, uh, on that within this context. So I just wanted to give you a little overview of what this thing is and then we'll talk about um, operations. So, um, you know, we're, we're, we're basically trying to go from the old PowerPoint style of uh, let me, I'm an executive, I need to ask a question, uh, then it's going to take three days for someone to come back with a static PowerPoint to answer that question. And, you know, God forbid, if I ask more than one person, I might get different answers. Um, very manual process. Uh, I know, you know, lots of us have been caught up in that where you have to, you know, respond. Uh, it's just not scalable. It can't be the way that we uh, move forward. And so we should be taking a, you know, more digital approach to this. So, um, providing that real-time access to the underlying information for the leaders um, so that they can see it the way they do, build notifications around them, like I mentioned, uh, and sort of take an attention management uh, focus to things. And then uh, when you have that foundation, becoming predictive uh, to, to better inform decision-making. So that, that's kind of the, the place where this particular uh, part of the business um, saw the value. And, um, you know, specific just to educate briefly on what's important to the operations part of the house, uh, these are kind of the business objectives that we want to deliver through, uh, through these things. And so uh, ensuring supply is obviously very important. Every patient, every time uh, is something that Amgen takes very seriously. Uh, and so that, that's kind of, of, of utmost importance, as well as advancing the pipeline, uh, driving uh, business and financial performance, improving uh, talent development uh, and investing in new capabilities. So those are kind of the business objectives that are in play. And then um, how does that actually break down to what would show up in sensing? So we can take the uh, insure supply um, uh, commitment, for example, and, and look at what some of those uh, different measures might be. So on time full delivery, um, uh, product specific inventory and so forth. And those can be tiered uh, uh, in a hierarchy down to the site level. And so um, going through and identifying those and then coming up with the right visualizations uh, to surface that information in a way, and, and you know, this, this can be a bit challenging. Uh, it sounds simple to say, okay, well then we'll just put red, yellow, and green uh, stoplights on some of that stuff. But that's, uh, uh, you know, coming up with a shared de definition of what those thresholds are can be a challenge in, in a large diverse business. And so uh, coming to, to uh, a consensus on what those things are uh, and what the different thresholds might be really um, engenders a, a very important conversation uh, among uh, the company and the leadership. So um, this gives you, you know, unfortunately, as you imagine, this is a system that I don't have the option of taking lots of screenshots and sharing, but you can get the sense of, of the type of information, at least in the operations context, that would be there, uh, and then how you might nest uh, some visuals uh, in, in the poll system uh, to make that apparent. All right, so a, a, a subject near and dear to my heart, uh, digital product management. Uh, this is the, the mode by which we are operating to, to, to deliver this. Uh, and it's interesting having uh, come from a leadership role in the knowledge management space uh, within the company uh, into a, a digital product management space. Uh, there's a lot of overlap. I feel well, well suited in this space uh, with that KM background. So um, one thing I always like to point out is um, one of the big differences in how you operate aside from the difference between a, a project mentality and a product mentality is the notion that you're on an integrated product team. So, um, and, and there's a lot, when, when you think about things from a knowledge perspective, there's a lot of, of, of value here. Um, we can get much better decisions by the product team and improve cycle time in getting uh, things out the door if all the right people are sharing knowledge in all the right times. And this is actually executed through what we call our integrated product team. So, you know, nothing, nothing earth shattering here. This isn't any different than the way, say, Apple would manage a product or we may even look at a pharmaceutical. Uh, but it's the idea that you have your, your business users in the room 
uh, with the people who own the features you're developing, with your designers uh, that are present, with all the engineering talent is there. Your developers, uh, your DevOps folks, all those people are present. So you never get a design decision made in the absence of engineering input, uh, or you don't get an engineering solution developed uh, that doesn't align with, with overall design. Uh, and so taking that model um, it has been um, hugely effective. And uh, I love the quote, Jim McCarthy quote off to the right. Um, you can read it faster than I can read it to you. Uh, but there's a lot of healthy debate, let's just say, that goes on when you have, um, you know, an outspoken integrated product team like that. But I look forward to these are my favorite meetings <clears throat> uh, during the week. So another way uh, to look at digital product management is uh, uh, it as an ongoing journey, and it has a different set of planning horizons. And I think one of the advantages of, of folks uh, that see the world through the knowledge lens, uh, they understand these long-term views. Uh, and so when we think about the product, um, you know, we, we do spend a lot of time focused in the short term on what that next release is. Uh, so I'm looking three months out, six months out managing, uh, managing that for, for the organization, but uh, that's uh, to impact what that longer term view is. So, um, you know, what, what is the three year um, uh, set of things that we're working towards and that, that informs the, the product roadmap and, and the prioritization uh, decisions that we make today. But, you know, at the end of the day, something as valuable as this has a strategic impact. You know, we're, we're building analytical muscle uh, in our machine learning and uh, Gen AI teams here to um, enable us to do the kind of things that are going to be important three years out, five years out, 10 years out, and really help enable the future of the company. Um, I had to sneak in. Uh, anyone who knows me knows how much I love my Airstream trailer. So I had to sneak a photo in uh, of that uh, on one of our, our trips. In case you're wondering, that's, uh, that is mine. <laughs> I won't talk about SAFE. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with that, but that this is how we operate. Uh, it gives us a common language to interact with our IT organization uh, in a way that, that uh, lets us do Agile to the extent that, that uh, we can within our organization. So um, one of the, the, the final points on digital product management is the idea that um, this has really shifted the focus to organizational intelligence, something I'm very passionate about. Um, and, you know, you can find yourself talking a lot about Agile, you can find yourself talking a lot about um, OpenAI and ChatGPT or uh, SharePoint or whatever it might be. Um, but at the end of the day, what really matters and how I'm judging the maturity of what we're doing is by the discussions that are happening on the information itself. Um, and so I, I think I heard Owen say, you know, applying uh, uh, some of the the the, the learning. Uh, this is in a similar context. The idea of what are we actually doing to improve what needs to be input into a decision? Uh, how do we acquire that information? How do we manage attention? Uh, how do we do those things? What does red, yellow, and green actually mean? And what's the right threshold for for making people aware of certain changes to that? Um, not is it in SharePoint, is it uh, done with ChatGPT and things like those are cool uh, things, but you know, what's really important. And I love this scale and RAL quote that I think um, really gets that home. Uh, and if anyone doesn't know who he is, he's a, the uh, photographer who's famous for, for these beautiful photos in the, in the Sierras, in the Eastern Sierras uh, of uh, the golden hour. Uh, and uh, this was my feeble attempt at reproducing something similar there in uh, in Thousand Oaks here in the Kineo Valley. But anyway, um, very, um, very important to think beyond medium. So I'll touch briefly on some benefits and uh, challenges. Um, so um, obviously that, that access to real time information uh, accelerates decision making that kind of goes uh, without savings, but uh, without saying, but I think the savings that um, <laughs> is nothing to, to, to uh, forget about is all of that work, all of that cycle time, all of that gunk that goes into producing all of that PowerPoint. You know, I, I make the joke with my team sometimes that like, I feel like my mission is to eliminate PowerPoint 
And if that were to happen within the company, I could retire. So I think I'll be working a long time. But, um, you know, the, the idea that a business, say there's a quarterly business review, say the, 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 there's a hundred slide PowerPoint that goes into that for review. That's a tremendous amount of work that this can essentially automate. And I think that's actually going on right now. Um, automate where possible. I think that uh, uh, pretty straightforward. Um, the, the work spent in, in, in acquisition and scanning of information, the work spent in sharing information, we can automate all that. We can really get our experts to focus on insight generation and get those things uh, visible. Uh, get that knowledge exposed where it needs to in the executive audience uh, through um, automation that can save a lot of time and enable more space for that. Um, and then I've mentioned um, enabling a foundation for more advanced predictive insights. Like you can't, I think there's this misconception and I, having run, you know, an analytical team prior to this, that you oftentimes get the ask and you go predict this, can we be predictive about that? Well, until you build the foundation uh, around data and, and information uh, in, in these different domains, until you build the analytical muscle uh, in the team, you're not ready to, to do that. And so I think one of the things I, I like to think about is that's what we're doing here is building that foundation. Um, some lessons learned to share uh, with everybody. I think, um, you know, it's all about the data. Uh, it, it, you know, you hear that, but it's really true. 80% of the work's going to go into um, uh, getting that, getting the right source of truth, uh, aligning definitions, like I mentioned, um, you know, is, is red, you know, is it really red? Is it really green? Um, how do you define these things, particularly when you've got a large business uh, that's spread across different sites and cultures and so forth? Um, I love uh, the, the next one, um, you know, having your user, in this case, a, a senior business person engaged from the start. Now, that's not an easy thing. They're not, it's usually not comfortable for them. And I like to tell people, you know, you're going to have to be comfortable with sawdust on the floor. Um, you know, we, we were in there, we were doing the kitchen, uh, but, you know, we're going to show it to you as we go. And you're going to be able to make changes uh, and get something more uh, close to what you're looking for. But that means it's not perfect. That means there'll be sawdust on the floor. Uh, and, um, you know, they're not used to that. And it's an important mentality shift. So you need some behavior changes on the part of, of the customer as well. And then, uh, you know, we're actively working in the organizational change management realm uh, at looking at adoption and what does that mean and the different patterns of usage. Uh, and so we're, we're actively evolving that. Um, and, you know, I, I, some may be interested in the, in um, the AI piece of all this, of which I have a, a whole separate presentation. Uh, and that, that's obviously a huge focus for us at the moment as well. Um, so anyway, I think I landed us right on time, I hope. <laughs> yes, you have. Thank you so much.